Okay, sorry about that. Before I had some internet woes over here, um, but I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my first year as faculty and just some things that I have learned along the way um, and maybe things that I wish that I had thought more about. And so this is just an overview of kind of where I'm planning on going. I'm going to give you a little bit of context and then I'm going to talk about kind of four pillars, four areas that I think are sort of worth keeping in mind as you enter into the first year. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to, I think, have a little bit of time for discussion in, in breakout groups. Um, so if at any time I start breaking up, please feel free to like chime in and let me know because I'm, I'm calling it. I've got like five different technologies going right now. <laughs> so I keep me kind of posted on how things are going on the viewer's end. But all right. So the first one is context. Where am I and how does this maybe compare to where you're going and where some of the other speakers that have uh, spoken so far are located. So I'm at Wake Forest University uh, in North Carolina. I'm an assistant professor here. And I think of Wake Forest as kind of this hybrid between um, a very teaching focused school, like maybe a small liberal arts college and a research focused school, like an R1. So we are technically designated as an, an R2. Um, which means that we offer doctorates, but our research level is um, like I think high instead of highest or something like this. Um, but just kind of as the culture that I picked up on as I was kind of interviewing at Wake and also just after my first year here is basically it's, um, it's very undergrad focused. And so there's a very strong uh, emphasis on teaching. And then this emphasis on reach, research has sort of been something that's been growing more and more over the years as the school itself has been growing. So we're affiliated with a medical school here um, that has lots and lots of research, but, uh, but I'm on the undergrad campus, which is a little more undergrad focused. And so just to give an idea of what my time is, technically, like for my contract, I spend 45% of my time doing teaching, 45% doing research, and 10% on service. So I think that that's pretty typical of these types of universities, although I'm not entirely sure because I, I haven't seen any other contracts, but I think that that's sort of um, not an atypical situation. And so, um, like, I think it was it Beth or was it Joe? Somebody, one of the two that just recently spoke also had a 2 2 teaching load. So I have a 2 2 teaching load. That means I teach two classes in the fall and two classes in the spring. Um, and our classes are small, they're about 35 students at most. Um, the statistics department, we have uh, far more large classes compared to a lot of other departments. We tend to have um, bigger groups, but. And then um, we have a strong emphasis, as I mentioned, on undergraduate learning. So we do have a master's program, but not a doctorate program in our particular department. But most of our focus and energy is on the undergrad learning. So that's just some context. You can kind of see um, what, what my day-to-day -day looks like from a teaching perspective. And from a research perspective, um, grant funding in my department is encouraged but not required. As part of my startup, I did get some lab space and some startup funds to start a lab, but my lab is going to be majority undergraduate students, which is different than some of my colleagues, like in biostatistics, for example, which is where I was trained, uh, who would have predominantly um, either PhD students or postdocs in their labs. Okay, so the first part about uh, kind of figuring out your, your first year as faculty uh, is getting to know the, the, the department, and so the culture of the department. Oh, can you guys still see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, because it so it says that I'm like connecting still. Perfect. Okay, so uh, taking time to get to know your department and university. So, um, from a kind of cultural perspective, I think of two areas that um, that that we focus on. The first being that there is kind of this hierarchy, and maybe even more than just two. So. There's the university norms, which would be um, things like, uh, you know, um, kind of what happens on a global level. And then you could drill down a little more and talk about departmental norms, what happens in your department. And then if you have a large enough department, you could imagine even thinking about what happens at the kind of at your specialty level. Um, so my, my department's not big enough that we really have specialty levels. So I'm just going to talk about university norms and departmental norms. Hey, Beth, I'm uh, Lucy. I I think yes. that we can see your slide, but it actually seems to be stuck on an earlier slide. Yeah. Yeah. I said that's what I because I'm I've been bumped out. I'm looking on my computer. It doesn't look like I'm in the Zoom meeting anymore. Oh, can you I, share 
I'm happy to share my uh, slides. Yeah, well, that I'll take over the sharing. And if I fall behind, you can let me know um, to advance. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, hopefully, I think I, I need to figure out how to jump back. Are folks able to see the slides? Yes. Yeah, I can okay. see. Okay. Um, I think you were at university norms. Is that right? I was. Yes, I was at university norms. Um, okay. And yeah, perfect. Thanks. Sorry, Nina. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Problems. It's like no worries. <laughs> okay. So university norms. So the first being thinking about um, kind of what what is it? What meetings do assistant professors typically attend? And so that. Um, you know, is things like at the university level, there are, it seems, infinite number of meetings and so there, and that are typically open to all faculty. And so because we don't have infinite time, kind of trying to figure out which ones are um, going to be the most bang for your buck in terms of both like getting visibility with uh, upper level folks in your university and also for your own professional development and things like that, which ones will be most important. And so the way that I was able to sort of Set this out was a little bit of trial and error. I think you could certainly ask your colleagues, which would have been probably a good first move on my part. Um, I basically went through, like when the university would email us that a meeting was happening open into all faculty at the very beginning of my uh, time at, at Wake, I just sort of jumped to go to all those meetings and very quickly figured out that there were some that there were literally zero other professors at, uh, and there were others that had maybe more or, or fewer. So that was sort of um, something that I figured out trial and error wise. And then the next would be what types of service roles do assistant professors usually take on? And so thinking about things like, um, you know, do they typically start serving on university wide committees, which at some schools they do and some schools they don't. And so that would be another thing to sort of ask people uh, in your in your department or maybe um, even when you're interviewing, you can talk to people about kind of what the typical service um, that an assistant professor takes on. And then the last would be what visibility is important and what is less so. And so by that, I mean, you know, I think um, it is good to sort of be visible within your university wide community, especially kind of depending on what type of role you're taking on. There's some promotion decisions that uh, take place outside of just your department. And so gaining visibility can be good, um, but also the infinite time portion of all of this is also worth considering. And so figuring out kind of what parts of this are very typical for um, people to kind of join in on that would be useful for your long-term career versus ones that would maybe be less so. Uh, and then departmental norms. And so aside from just university norms, there's also certain norms inside your department. So this is all stuff that like, I mean, I've been in academia now pretty much my whole life for like 27, 28 years and I, did not have a good sense of how departmental meetings were run because I had not been to any of them until I became a faculty member. And so um, just kind of knowing about the, the way that your department typically runs meetings, do they have sort of like Robert's rules of order that they like to follow? Uh, do they want kind of, or is there a bit of a hierarchy and kind of who speaks up during a meeting is the best way to get your voice heard? Uh, maybe talking to people prior to the meeting and asking them to bring your opinions forward. See, all these kind of political things that sound really silly uh, could sometimes be kind of useful in terms of just navigating the best best way to um, move forward. And I think part of this too, like it, I feel like I sound silly even just saying some of these things, like at, like talk to people who are kind of higher up before a meeting to try to get your opinions pushed through. But there is a balance between like actually getting the thing done that you need to get done and trying to like fight the system that is maybe not a good system. I'm not saying it's a bad system, but some of the systems are bad. But I think that there's sort of like you have to simultaneously think about how to like move for forward in the system and also be able to like by tomorrow get the thing done that you're trying to get done. And so being able to sort of strike that balance is something that uh, I've been working on in this first year. And then the next thing being kind of in the same vein, thinking about the best ways to be heard, but aside from just in meetings, thinking about sort of how decisions are made in the department. And so in some departments, they're very committee based. Um, and sometimes in your first year, you won't get put on committees because I think they're trying to protect your time, which is really great. But if you're someone that has a lot of opinions, there has ways that you hope to be able to influence things, you might want to ask about kind of how those different decisions are being made and whether or not there's a way for your voice to be heard as well. And then uh, fi uh, finally, the visibility kind of question. So different departmental norms, for example, do people tend to keep their office doors open when they're working or 
do people tend to work from home if they're not teaching and things like that? I think that's something that um, is good to maybe get a feel for even at the interview stage to make sure that your norms kind of mesh with your department's norms, but also to make sure that you're sort of following what may be unwritten rules along the way, I think can be helpful to sort of suss out. Some of these things I think are just generally for any job, but um, things that I was kind of encountered with when I was starting in, in this faculty position. And then being a team player, I think that that's a, a big piece of this is sort of thinking about how one thing that's really nice um, about a faculty position is that you sort of are in some sense um, on this big team of people who really all have similar goals in terms of really enjoying the same academic discipline that you, you happen to enjoy. And so kind of trying to find ways that you can best help that team um, do well can be can be useful and figuring out how your skill set can kind of best fit in with the department. I, I, it is, I assume it's, it will fit in because that's why they hired you. They think that you have something unique that you can bring to that department. So figuring out kind of what they thought and how you fit in in that role. Okay, so then the next part is becoming a peer. So this is transitioning from graduate student or postdoc to peer. Um, and this is particularly hard for me. I find it um, in general kind of challenging to think about how to sort of assert authority or whatever it might be. And, and not that you need to necessarily even do it kind of um, cognizantly, but just sort of keeping in mind that you are no longer a student or, um, you know, in, in this role where you're kind of um, now you're, you're should be thought of as a peer with your colleagues and how to make that transition. And so uh, the, for me, there's kind of three ways that, that this manifested. The first being my role as a collaborator. And so I think statistics in general tends to be a pretty collaborative role, although I suppose that depending on what type of job you take on, you may or may not have collaborators. But for me, kind of thinking about the transition from being a student or a postdoc collaborator to being uh, on faculty when I'm collaborating and just sort of how that um, how that role is maybe slightly different and how I might need to carry myself slightly differently in order to fill kind of a more of a peer position. And then the next thing, and this is something that I think um, is good to put some thought into before you jump into a new role is sort of just what you prefer to be referred to as, which again was something that I hadn't put a lot of thought into before I started but ended up coming up a whole lot right at the beginning. And so it would have been nice for me to have sort of taken some time to think about it. So for example, do you want students to refer to you as Dr. D'Agostino McGowan or as professor or by your first name or some combination? I have a colleague that goes by Dr. Rob. So he kind of does a little bit of the first name plus a, um, a title. And so thinking that through, I think um, before you kind of jump in can be nice just because um, it's good to sort of have a bit of consistency there. And it's also good to think about it because I know this is something that gets, I think, a good amount of attention, but just the idea that this, your decision here has ripple effects, which, I mean, all decisions you make tend to have ripple effects in some regard. Um, but, you know, deciding to go by your first name might have implications for your colleagues if um, they don't feel like that's something, that, a choice that they could make and still assert authority in a classroom. And so sort of thinking through those implications can be important and also, for me, as someone who has some trouble sort of um, feeling like a peer as opposed to a student, you, it, it was an important thing for me to sort of find ways to delineate myself from the students in that way. And then finally, how you interact with graduate students. And so this is like the hardest part for me because I felt like I was a graduate student five seconds ago, even though I did do a postdoc in between. Um, but we have graduate students in our department and we are able to lead their research. and. Um, and I think just sort of thinking about um, how you want to approach that can be can be good to sort of at least be cognizant of the fact that, you know, that I, for me, it was sort of finding both the humility and the confidence to sort of be able to direct research um, for people who I, in some cases, am younger than and um, things like that. So that is another element to all of this to think about. Okay, now finding harmony. So by harmony, in this particular case, I'm talking about finding harmony between teaching, research, and service. In some other talks that I've given, I talk about um, like work-life work, work -life balance and work-life harmony. And, and so I kind of, I prefer this word harmony because I think balance is just not something that's gonna be struck on, on a daily or even an annual basis. Like I think balance maybe is a nice goal for like long-run averages, but in general, we're sort of doing more with harmony. 
Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, I have these kind of three roles that, um, that my contract specifies and it's half and half teaching research and then the 10% service. Um, and so first focusing on teaching, kind of finding that harmony, especially in the first year, um, I think it can be really easy to put all your time into teaching, especially with new prep. Uh, and even if you're in an institution where teaching is your predominant role, I think um, it can be worthwhile to kind of set up systems to be able to put some checks on this, because even in that case, you don't have infinite time and you don't want to be sort of spending time um, kind of infinitely tweaking things when that's not necessarily getting you much more than incremental benefit. And so uh, for me, things like, for example, the things I spent my most time on would be like trying to find the perfect data set to um, answer a specific question, or maybe uh, trying to really craft a very thoughtful exam question. And these are like good things to spend your time on, but not good things to spend infinite time on. Um, and so the way that I was able to sort of balance this in some way was to try to set aside specific time that I spent on uh, teaching or prepping for teaching and then really trying to be cognizant of kind of moving on um, and with the like mindset that this is not the first time or the or, well, it is the first time it's not the last time that I'm going to be teaching this class and so I'm going to kind of do the best job I can with this version of it and there are going to be things that I could infinitely iterate on that maybe wouldn't have that much impact on students and there could be other things that I wouldn't have thought of that a student or a group of students may bring up in evaluations or in some feedback that I solicit that I could potentially incorporate and so kind of this infinite inter iterating might not be the best use of my time so just sort of keeping that in mind and so there's different ways to strategize this um, and so, as I mentioned, like scheduling specific teaching or non-teaching time on your calendar. Uh, for me, I like to teach in blocks. And so I, for the past few semesters, have requested to teach Tuesday, Thursday, back to back. And that basically ensures that um, Tuesday and Thursday, I devote basically those entire days to teaching. And so I do my prep and my practice before I do my teaching. I have my office hours. Um, and that kind of, is, for me, content switching wise is been really useful. I know other people in my department who take the exact opposite approach. They prefer to do all their teaching in the mornings, and so they teach every single day of the week from eight to nine, and that's just like the, the way that they do it best, and, um, and that's the way that they're able to content switch effectively too. So there's different strategies for sure, but kind of coming up with one that maybe can um, help you to be able to best use the time that you have for, for that, I think is um, useful. And the next is for research, and so this may or may not be applicable depending on what type of role you're hoping to do, but I thought I'd mention a couple things that I found useful in my first year. And the first was just to get to know the administration. And so depending on what kind of research agenda you're trying to achieve, um, the administration, like for example, in at my school, we have uh, certain people in a grants office who help with not only organizing grants, but managing my startup and also kind of determining if I can pay students and how I pay students and things like that. And so getting to know those people really well, um, I think it's really helpful because there are a lot of unwritten rules that um, I think are useful to sort of help navigate, especially if you're gonna be interacting with those people uh, frequently. And uh, the next is to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the procedures. And so this was when, for me, my first semester, I um, decided I was going to apply for an NSF grant. And I happened to go to like a professional development seminar with one of the, the associate provosts that was talking about grant applications. And I was like maybe a week and a half away from my deadline. And it came up in this professional development thing that they have this like internal routing system at Wake Forest, which I think is pretty common, where they basically want you to submit your grant through them and then they submit to the funding agency. And this was something that I, I had, I've been on numerous grants uh, as a graduate student, but I never was the one who actually clicked the button. So I had no idea that something like this existed. And, um, and so kind of, I, I, and I was like a week and a half out and not really super prepared to submit what I had so far to an internal routing system. And so I had to kind of scramble to get something to them so they could still have the week of time um, before they actually click the submit button. And so this is just kind of an example of getting to know the procedures for your institution for sort of under, understanding the best practices in that regard. Uh, and then this is not popular advice. So I'm going to give it anyways, but not a, a lot of people probably, I don't know. I've heard that 
some people don't agree with, with this, but for me, I found it very helpful. Um, if you plan on getting grant funding to apply for a grant as soon as possible, if nothing else to figure out the process. Um, and so I think this is, um, again, even if you've been on grants, for me, I had been on several grants, but it was very different kind of taking one from start to finish on my own or in a, in a team that I was leading. And I think it was a really, really informative process and most funding, I mean, depending on the agency you're funding to, a lot of times the first one doesn't get funded anyways. And I'm not saying to submit something that's terrible, but I do think kind of going through that whole process is really, really useful. And so if you can do it, if you can find time to do it early, I think that can be beneficial so that you can actually, especially if you're in an institution that requires grant funding, I think um, getting one in kind of early just for the process can be helpful. And then finally, finally, it's a double dip. So this is, especially if you're somewhere that's a nice hybrid where there's um, a big emphasis on teaching and an emphasis on research, which I think is everybody here probably is going to target places that do target teaching because that's kind of what we love to do. And so finding ways to double dip with things like stat education or um, various aspects like that where you can both get um, you can you can get maybe a little bit of research credit for something that you're doing in the classroom, I think is a, a good a good way to go and something that I've been sort of trying to pursue as well. And then service, so again, kind of figuring out departmental norms for service and what is expected. And so um, if you're looking into like tenure positions, sometimes they want you to have a bit of a national presence. And so kind of what that means in terms of service and research is important. For me, this is also hard because service is like my favorite part and it's the thing that I do the least, I mean, in terms of my contract. And, and I, the advice that I've heard many times is that um, despite you know, good service is important, but it is not going to outweigh bad teaching or bad research. And so you want to kind of keep that balance in mind, too, when you're taking on roles um, kind of outside of, of what might be expected from your department. Um, but this is something, so if you're interested in filling roles uh, and you don't know where to find them, I have found that there are lots of people, senior folks that are um, offered leadership roles that are happy to pass them down. Actually, Mina, I, Mina is a really good example of this. She, I feel like every time I get recommended for something, it's because Mina <laughs> recommended me to do it. And so um, I think this is something that I hope to be able to do as I become a more senior faculty member in years to come. But what I've really benefited from senior folks recommending me for roles. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, I think it's definitely appropriate to tell people who might be getting these offers that no longer feel like they want to do them, um, that you would be interested in them passing them down to you. Uh, and so that's things like, for example, the American Statistical Association has a lot of leadership roles that, um, that they are really eager to have early career folks fill. And so kind of figuring out the right channels to do that while also still balancing your um, obligations within your role, I think can be good. And again, it's unusual for strong service to make up for not so great teaching. This is like, a, or research, which is like a sad face. I, I mean, not sad face. I think teaching and research is also great, but I, um, but yeah, I think it's, you want to make sure you don't spend all your time on the service part because it doesn't necessarily, at least for promotion, it maybe doesn't get you as far. Okay, and then finally, community. So the last part is just finding a community of mentors and peers to sort of uplift you throughout the way. And so um, in this regard, first, uh, kind of thinking about mentors. Um, so for me, the the an important aspect of, of finding mentors was to sort of find mentors that were in a multitude of areas. And so not just in my department or not even just in my university, but finding them also outside um, has been super helpful. And I think it's just a way to sort of reality check a little bit and also to sort of help you think about long-term career goals. And so um, I have sought out basically people in my department who both are um, slightly more senior and much more senior, and then also people within the university who uh, are kind of more senior and have a little more of a long view of what the university expects. And then similarly, I've tried to kind of collect mentors along the way from outside the university. And in addition to mentors, I think peers are really helpful both inside and outside of your department um, and inside and outside of the university as well. And so I, if you have the luxury of joining a department with other assistant professors, I think that's a great way to sort of be able to, um, to have a group of peers who you can sort of bounce ideas off of and 
uh, uplift when things seem a little bit hard and complain to when things seem a little bit tough. Um, but it's also nice to have that outside of the university. And so for me, there's a, a Slack channel called New PI Slack that uh, has been really nice. It's basically a global Slack channel for assistant professors that uh, we all kind of chat about all different kind of things that are teaching related or research related or just university related. And it's been nice to sort of hear about what other university norms are and things like that. And then also the Slack channel, um, do we, do, does everybody join the Preparing to Teach Slack channel? Is that something? Oh. Oh, Mina, you're muted. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not okay. yet, but I am going to send the invites after we wrap up today. Oh, great. Oh, perfect. Okay. So that was another one that um, I, it, doesn't, it didn't have as much activity as some of the other ones, but, but maybe it will at some point. And I think it's sort of a nice place to, to collect everybody to, so that there's a chance for you to sort of talk to other people that are at the same place as you, which I think is really nice. And I know in the past year, since I did preparing to teach in August, people posted like job postings and stuff like that there, which was nice. So now um, it's your turn. So I think we're going to do breakout groups um, to discuss kind of what you're expecting and, and any questions that you might have and things like that. Um, you know, if you go in two slides, I've got just like a link to um, a blog post that sort of, so this live for your dichotomized back on my blog and I've got a summary of these slides there. Um, I'm on Twitter at Lucy Stats, and these the uh, slides themselves are uh, the link is uh, in the Google Doc too. So 